Good afternoon. You know, 30 years ago, I raised my right hand, took the oath of office to serve and protect the citizens of the greater Louisville area. In fact, I had just taken the oath to become a Jefferson County police officer. I was honored to serve my hometown and honored to serve with some of the bravest individuals I'd ever met in my life. Since then, in the 30 years that have passed, I've had a tremendous blessed career. I've had the opportunity to chat with two presidents regarding crime issues. I've been able to sit down with two United States Attorney Generals and actually have a discussion about juvenile crime and the future of American society in regards to juveniles. And once I was called before Congress to testify in regards to homeland security issues, specifically how they were being addressed in cities and the threats that were in the cities. It was an honor to serve in these capacities. But I have to tell you, after 30 years, I'm a little troubled today because I believe that our citizens and our police officers deserve better because I can honestly tell you that the way we train police officers now, the methodology upon which we train them is incomplete. And once again, our officers who sacrifice their lives and, and their injuries time and time again deserve better and so do our public. Let me explain what I mean by that. Right now, if you're a young person, you come to training, you're gonna get the, about the same training that I received 30 years ago. You're going to be told how to patrol, better ways to patrol. Now today, we do a better job of talking about community policing and different things, but at the end of the day, we still train how to patrol. We train how to make an arrest. We've gotten better in 30 years about how we do that safely. But then we also train how to incarcerate people. What I mean by that is how do we testify in court to ensure that individuals go to jail. So what are we going to do about these issues? How are we going to address these issues long term to ensure that we're on the right path? Well, I will tell you this. I think that each city in America needs to be focused on data. They need to understand what is occurring. And data is able to tell us some things that we haven't seen in the past. It's shown us the ill effects of this type of policing, of arresting and prosecuting to the fullest extent of the law. It has demonstrated to us the mass incarceration that has resulted. Is it fair in the United States of America that a person goes to jail simply because they live in a tough area of town compared to an area that they wouldn't go to jail if they didn't live there? I don't think it is. We have to address that and we have to be honest, not only in law enforcement, in the community addressing these issues. I also want to point out that when we look at these cities across America, all of America's major cities, that individuals are struggling in many areas, that there are large areas within each of our cities where people are in despair, people are struggling, people feel like they're without voice, they're without hope. We need to address that. Someone told me recently that they believe that this was the number one threat to our cities. And if our cities are the economic engine that fuels this great country, then it's the number one threat to our country as a whole. Let me give you a better understanding of what's going on in every city in America, but specifically the city that's closest to us today that's a large city, and that's Indianapolis, Indiana. Remember, this data is a couple years old, but it'll demonstrate the purpose. There's six key areas. Some people call those focus areas, others call them intersections, but that's eight square miles out of 400 square miles in the city of Indianapolis. When you start adding up the people in those areas, that's 4.7% of the population 4.7% of the entire population of the city of Indianapolis resides in these eight square miles. But when you live in that area, that 4.7% of the population resides in an area where 27% of the murders occur, 30% of the non-fatal shootings. To put it another way, we're talking about 600% more likely to have a murder or a non-fatal shooting in these areas than anywhere else in the city of Indianapolis. Education levels at the lowest levels possible in the city, lower than anywhere else. Is it any wonder with all this stocked up against them that there's a 239% greater likelihood to have a mental health run by EMS in this area compared to everyone else? And then to make matters worse, 22 to 23% of the residents in this area, 22 to 23% are unemployed. At the peak of the Great Depression, the unemployment rate was 25%. These areas are depression-like, people struggling. And remember what I said earlier, when we patrol, arrest, and incarcerate, it's not going to help people in these areas. 
in addition to the arrest and prosecution, we need to start focusing on what we can do beforehand. And I will say this is a public safety initiative. Hear what I said. I didn't say a police initiative. I said a public safety initiative. That means that anyone wears a uniform that responds to your home in any type of emergency would be involved. That means that our probation and parole officers, court systems, prosecutors need to be involved. But the three pillars that I say are essential to public safety to get to the root causes of crime are simply this. Financial security, behavioral health, and those left behind. Most of the numbers I'm showing you could be reflected in these major areas within each and every city of America. First of all, financial security. It is hard to believe in the midst of this economic prosperity that is America now, the economic engine that are cities, that 40 million Americans are living in poverty. If you make $15,000 a year and you live in New York City, the federal government says you do not live in poverty if you're single. The same if you have a family of four and you make 24,500. So while poverty numbers give us an understanding of some of the despair that's happening in our major cities, it doesn't give us an accurate picture. Maybe something more accurate is food insecurity, meaning every night people go to bed hungry in our major cities, in these areas of despair. If we were going to try to solve that food disparity issue and food insecurity issue in Indianapolis, Indiana, it would cost citizens $83 million. To the city just north of us today, in Chicago, Illinois, $354 million. Now you're starting to get a picture of what it's like to live in these areas of despair in our major cities. You may find it odd, but I have included under financial security property crime. We don't pay a lot of attention to property crime and policing. I hate to say that, but it's true. We don't pay a lot of attention in the media. The public doesn't pay a lot of attention. Once in a while, if there's a spike, you'll hear a news story. But let me tell you the importance of monitoring property crime. If you live in one of these areas of despair, if you live in one of these areas where people are struggling to make ends meet, and you've been able to scrape up enough money to buy an iPad for your family, and now you can connect socially, your children connect socially, and your children are doing better in school because they have the resources now with that iPad. When that iPad gets stolen, that is just a property crime, another number in the books for the police department. For that family, that is a life-altering event. And we need to be aware of that in public safety as we move forward and try to find ideas and suggestions on how to deal with these challenges. Behavioral health. I have not studied in a major city yet that suicides don't outpace murders, usually two to one, sometimes more than that. This is what's happening in many of our major cities across America. I've also put violent crime under a behavioral health issue. We talk about victims of crime, and some cities do a very good job of dealing with people that have a violent crime history, that have been a victim of a violent crime. They send services and help. Some cities don't do a very good job, but most do, especially large cities. But what about that victim's family? They've been victimized as well. Then we have to change our thought process a little bit. What about the perpetrator's family? Aren't they victimized as well because of the actions of a loved one? And then this gets a little bit tougher. What about the perpetrator? That individual is going to prison and should go to prison, but guess what? They're going to get out of prison. What are we doing to make sure that when they return, they don't go right back into that life of crime and harm another American citizen? And so those left behind, who are they? Are they citizens that are living in our cities? and they see all of this building, all the entertainment venues, all the people moving to major cities, money is growing constantly, tax base is growing constantly, but yet they feel like they're left behind? Is it the immigrant community that we know that is moving to major cities in these areas of despair, looking to assimilate and find jobs so they can provide for their children and live that American dream? And once again, what about those thousands upon thousands of prisoners that come back to the streets each and every year in our nation, many of them with mental health issues, many of them with dependency issues, and with all those issues and a criminal record, is it any wonder 
that since we have very little services for them, that 76%, 76% return to prison within five years. So that's some of the macro data, large data. But here's my proposal. Every city in America should develop data based on these three pillars. Every city in America should be able to tell you what numbers they have of financial security, behavioral health, and people left behind for every block in America. When we look at these large numbers, we think it's too large to fix. It's not too large if we take small increments. You may think that's impossible, but it's not. In Denver, Colorado, we have put together what we say is a Denver Opportunity Index. Denver Opportunity Index. It's simply based on data on the three pillars. I am not including all the vast amounts of data that we have, but I want to share with you how we can start understanding what people are living like in certain areas and work collectively and collaboratively as government to deal with these issues. In this census tract, there's 6,400 residents, median age of 31. There's 142 census tracts in the city of Denver. There's only 100 square miles. So this census tract represents a half square mile. We know what citizens are dealing with. If you have a ranking of one in the Opportunity Index, it means you have the greatest opportunities for success. You have the highest education, highest income. If you rank 142, it means you have the least amount of success. You have the highest poverty, least amount of income. These are the issues. If you just take a quick look at this Opportunity Index, you realize in this census tract, the people that are living there, uh, they rank 136. There's only six census tracts in the entire city of Denver that has more people in poverty than this area. Why is this important for cities to do? Because in cities, we try to have a one-size-fits-all mentality on policing. We have to realize that the challenges on the north side of our cities are different than the south side. The needs on the west side are different than the needs on the east side. And we need to have this data to make good, firm decisions to ensure that we're being effective and efficient with taxpayer dollars, but most importantly, to ensure that citizens are getting the services and the opportunities that they deserve. So people ask me all the time, do you really think this will work? I know it'll work because I've seen it in action. In Indianapolis, Indiana, Gleaner's Food Bank saw the food issues, the food insecurity, that $83 million. They saw the areas of abject poverty, and Gleaner's went out and they found people to help, and they have provided meals, hundreds of thousands of meals for people in those areas. And you know what the result has been? When we took a snapshot a year later, crime had dropped by over 10% just because basic needs were met. In the United States today, 25% of all police-related shootings involve someone with a mental health issue. The Police Executive Research Forum out of Washington, D.C. realized that work with local corporations and they develop training. They're going into cities now and training police officers how to deal better with people with mental illness. And because of that work and that collaborative effort, they have lowered the amount of use of force in those cities. And those left behind, after seeing the complete Denver Opportunity Index presentation, Volunteers of America realized that far too many individuals, far too many individuals are leaving jail and going to these areas of abject poverty. And they've disrupted that. They have been in the jails now talking to individuals saying to these individuals, come to the Volunteers of America, we're going to give you housing, we're going to give you jobs, we're going to give you counseling, and we're going to give you hope for the first time in your life. That's only been an initiative that's been ongoing for a few months. But as we speak today, zero is the amount of people that return to the Denver County Jail as a result of this work. Many people get the misconception that this is a big government program. It is not. It's using the government money and the people that we have now within departments of public safety. In Denver, we have 4,500 employees, and we have a budget of about $550 million. What's so good about this is it's not a government program. It's a retooling of public safety. It's a philosophical shift in the way we do public safety because we realize that public safety is everyone's responsibility. It's going to take all of us working together Look at these three success stories. Gleaners went out and found volunteers. They went out and found the funding. They went out and found the food just because we gave them the data necessary to do this. Perf saw the data that had been put together by the media 
and they went out and found corporations willing to give money to develop this on their own. And Volunteers of America saw a need and got engaged and changed the way they distribute services to meet the needs in the community. And it'll have a profound effect in the community. Here's what I will ask you. As American citizens, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. If you're concerned about your country, if you're concerned about your city, if you're concerned about human beings, take a moment and roll up your sleeves, get to work, give your time, talent, and treasures. Also, hold your mayors, your elected officials, your police chiefs, your fire chiefs, even your directors of public safety. Hold them accountable and make sure they give you accurate data and that they're working with you on a continual basis to develop strategies to make a difference in the community. I end with this, putting the famous words from the Declaration of Independence on the screen because I learned about them when I was younger and I've lived by those my entire life. Our foundation of this great republic is built on this document. Abraham Lincoln himself, when he talked about this document, said these are God-given rights. They're, they're inalienable. They're right there in front of us. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. You know, I've read in history where great men and women have used these words to call this nation, call this nation to repentance for the sins of slavery and discrimination. I've heard freedom-loving people around the world use these words to ensure that they can get relief from their oppression. But I have to tell you, I'm passionate about this. And the reason I'm passionate is when I look into our major cities today and I see some of the issues that are festering there, the issues of depravity, the issues of not having food, not having clothing, not having water to drink in some cases, I can honestly stand here and tell you that not all of our young people have those same rights that most of us have. How can you have the right to life when every day you're worried about your safety and someone else's safety? How can you have liberty when you don't have the basic education to get a job that pulls you out of poverty? And how in the world can you pursue happiness when each and every day you're struggling just to make ends meet and on most days you fall short? See, I truly believe we'll never know our full potential as a nation as great as we are until all of our residents have an opportunity to succeed. I hope and pray that you will join me on this endeavor. Thank you.